we react. And here we are, we're just gonna zen into this. So, so as I said, my colleague, Troy Love, is presenting today on finding peace, which we're really looking for right now. <laughs> <laughs> I shared a bit ago that um, he, he has on his uh, Psychology Today um, intro, my philosophy is to create a safe therapeutic environment in which you can be heard and supported while developing strategies to remove the barriers, keeping you from being authentic and connecting to others. And I think that is so important, particularly, you know, as addicts and even partners, that we get disconnected from others. And so having the ability to learn tools to reconnect is what helps us grow in our recovery. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Troy, so. Hello, everybody, thank you so much. I was I was saying that I just noticed that the slides or the PDF that I sent out had the title of Healing from Sexual Addiction. And I wanna clarify that although that's one of the main things that I do in my work, that the principles that I'm gonna be sharing with you really do fit with anybody who is struggling with any kind of addiction, any kind of relationship issues. Um, if you're a partner, if you're someone who's struggling with addiction of any kind, it really does fit. So hopefully uh, we can, uh, you can find some meaning from what we are gonna be going over today. When I, I was, I'm in middle school and I'm standing on the field of my gym class I'm looking down at the green grass and looking at the beautiful sky and we're playing soccer. And I think I'm the goalie and I'm really, really grateful that my team is really good because they're on the other end of the soccer field. They're kicking the ball down there because I am not good at soccer. In fact, I'm horrible at soccer. And so I'm so grateful that they're down there and I picked the goalie because I didn't understand soccer and didn't understand just how important that position is. And I just loved that I could just stand there and not have to do anything. I'm so grateful that they are playing down there and I'm just kind of enjoying the, the day when two boys come along and they grab my shorts and they pull them down to my ankles. And I'm standing there, uh, embarrassed uh they laugh they run away laughing and it, i probably would have thought hey it's not a big deal i i probably wouldn't have thought anything of it but i know what is going to happen when i go back to the locker room because it happens every time that we go back to the locker room as we change back into our regular clothes and we start to line up to wait for the bell to ring to be excused these boys will start to taunt me and they will start to call me names, gay, faggot, femme, stupid, all kinds of different names, some of them that I didn't even understand. And sometimes they would punch me and sometimes they would chase me home after school and try to beat me up. And so I hated Jim and I hated going home. And I didn't hate going home just because the bullies were gonna chase me because I had learned how to run pretty fast from them, but I hated to go home because when I got home, home was also not a safe place. My earliest memory is as a four or five year old little boy crouching in terror under the kitchen table as I'm watching my father throw my mother across the room. There was a lot of violence growing up in my home. And as me and my siblings started to grow up, we would even call 911 on our parents because we were afraid that one of them was gonna kill the other one. So I didn't really have a safe place to go to. And on top of all of that, or underneath all of that, I was adopted. And I was adopted at five days old. And I always wondered where uh, my birth family was, who my birth mother was. But it was a closed adoption, and so I, I had no idea about any of that. So I just kind of carried all of that with me. And then I decided to become a social worker. Uh, and I think a lot of us in the helping profession come into this, this profession because we have our own stuff. The interesting thing was that I didn't recognize that any of this stuff was my stuff. And I had a therapist, I had a teacher in my social work program who told me, hey, Troy, if you want to be a good social worker, you need to go do your own work. And I thought, well, I don't know what you're talking about because I, I'm fine. I don't have any problems. I'm good. Uh, I don't I don't know what you're talking about. 
So I kind of dismissed her and didn't really honor the truth of what she was speaking to me. And I began my internship at the Gateway Rehabilitation a Drug and Alcohol Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, which was founded by Abraham Tursky. And I'm sitting there as an intern with all these other individuals who are struggling with alcohol addiction, drug addiction. And I'm sitting in there and thinking that I couldn't actually relate to them. But as I began to hear their stories and how they battled with alcohol, drugs, and all the other stuff that came with it, I started to recognize that I absolutely could relate to them and that my coping of dealing with all the stuff that I had dealt with had turned into a sex addiction. And I didn't even know that was a thing. It was a porn addiction. Um, and I didn't even recognize until I'm sitting in that room that, oh, I'm, I'm struggling too. And that is what began my journey to try and find healing, to try and find a path to be free from the addictive parts of myself and to learn how to love myself. And as I began this journey, it took a long time for me to figure this out, um, but as I began to, to begin this journey, I realized that there are, that we're dealing with a yin and yang, and that's the second page of the PDF. We're dealing with a yin and yang, and in this yin and yang, there's pain and peace. And the interesting thing is that we can't have one without the other. We want to live in a world where there's just so much peace and joy and love and connection and happiness and bliss. We would love that. That sounds amazing. But the challenge is that if that's all we had, we actually wouldn't recognize that we had it. If that's all we had, we wouldn't recognize the joy that we're experiencing. We wouldn't recognize the glory of the, the sunsets and the beauty of the ocean. We wouldn't really recognize that because we've never experienced the other side, the dark side, as it were, the painful side of things, the, the darkness and the destruction of a burned forest or um, seeing the devastation of war or whatever. We, if, if we didn't see that, we wouldn't be able to experience the peace as well. And so they go together. And as much as we wish that we didn't want the pain in our lives, we have to have it. And actually, it, it becomes a, a blessing. I was, I was talking to my personal trainer the other day, and he was showing me his tattoo. And I don't even know why I asked him this, but I, uh, I said, do you re regret getting this massive tattoo on your back? And he said, no, I don't, I don't regret anything in my life. I said, you don't regret anything in your life? And he said, no. Every experience that I have done has been a learning experience for me. Every experience that I've in encountered has been something that I've learned something from. And some of it is, well, I'm not going to do that again, but I don't feel shame and guilt about it. And I'm like, whoa, that is freaking amazing. I wonder how you do that. But he's what he's talking about is he's learned how to live in this pain and peace Zen worlds where, yes, he's had painful experiences and he's learned from them and he's able to cross over to peace. So what I've learned along this journey, though, is that the things that cause us the most pain are what I call attachment wounds. And I've identified six of them. There's loss, neglect, rejection, abandonment, betrayal, and abuse. And each one of them sometimes overlaps with each other a little bit, but each one of them has their own experiences that go with that. So, for example, loss comes from you had a, a strong connection with a, a relative or a loved one, and then they contracted cancer or they died. A, they died. Um, they left, but it wasn't because of anybody trying to inflict pain on you. It's just part of the natural part of life, but it can be incredibly painful. It can also be that you had a really good friend and then you had to move across the country or that your friend moved across the country. A lot of individuals who grow up in the military, they move every three years and that's a loss. That's a loss that comes. They form these connections and then they have to, to leave them. So that's a loss. Neglect comes from a sense that someone's not paying attention to you. 
your basic needs of food and shelter, maybe getting met. And I know that some of you maybe lived in a home where even those needs weren't being met. But but your basic needs, food, shelter, clothes are being met. But to actually get the attention from your parents, your loved ones, it does not happen. They're too busy. They're watching TV. They're in front of a screen. They're they're doing something else. They're working in their garage, whatever it is that they're there, but they're not really there. And that can be a really painful wound. The third one is rejection. That's the wound that I was experiencing in the locker room with those boys. Just the message that there was something wrong with me, that I wasn't welcome, that I did I wasn't wanted. And so that rejection wound is one of my core wounds that really impacts my life. Abandonment is another wound. And for me, that abandonment wound happened the moment that I was born. For nine months, I was in my birth mother's womb. I could hear her voice. I could hear her heartbeat. I was literally connected to her. And then within minutes, I'm separated from her and I no longer hear her voice, no longer hear that heartbeat. And that's an abandonment. Like, for people, that's a wound when somebody walks out of your life and there's no explanation. You don't know why they left. And that can be a really incredibly painful wound. Betrayal, oftentimes as I'm working with spouses of um, individuals who have been struggling with sex addiction, that's a huge wound for them. They thought that they were living in a world where they could trust their partner. And then all of a sudden they found out that their partner was lying to them the whole time. And uh, there, that's a huge betrayal that then causes this wound inside of us. And the last one is abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, which to me is, is sometimes an, a corporation of all the other wounds, but it's a wound when someone is taking their woundedness out on you as a way of trying to cope with their own pain. So I use the analogy that these wounds are like actual wounds that are on your body, like a sunburn, for example, that if you forget to put sunscreen on and you go out and you spend some time in the sun, then you're, the next day you are in incredible pain. And you really, you're able to function. You go to school, you go to work, you go about your day-to-day -day life, but you really, really hope that nobody comes up and touches any of these wounds because if they do, there's an immediate reaction and it is so painful. And that's what these wounds are like. You can go through your day-to-day -day life, but somebody may say something or somebody may do something and it smacks up against that wound and it immediately causes us pain. What really happens is that over time, especially the younger we are when these wounds start to be developed, we begin to try and make sense out of why we have these wounds. And as a kid, we don't really have the cognitive ability to really make sense out of the fact that my, my dad had some serious issues and probably needed to go to therapy because he had some severe anger problems going on in his life. And he also found, comes to find out was also struggling with addiction himself. So I didn't know that. And I didn't have the ability to be able to say, oh, dad, you, you know, I'm going to go move over to the neighbor's house until you decide to get your act together. And mom, I'm really hoping that you can also develop your own sense of inner power so that you don't have to continue to do that. Like, I'm going to go hang out next door until you all figure that out. As a kid, I don't have the ability to do that. It's just what I know. But I then have to try and make sense of all of that. And what I tend to do, what we tend to do, is we end up coming up with belief systems about why these things are happening. And I, I write in my book that these core beliefs are tattooed on our hearts. I've, I've changed that a little bit. Not only are they tattooed on our hearts, but they're also tattooed on our nervous system so that they become the paradigm from which we experience the world. And whenever those wounds are smacked, it, activate, it, it activates that nervous system and that paradigm that we view the world in. And then it really does shift the way that we interact with each other. So these wounds, there's three genres of those. The first is I am not enough. Usually when we're looking at the core beliefs from a negative connotation as we grow up and then we want to change those later. But 
I am not enough. This is, I believe, the primary core belief that uh, people who are struggling with addiction struggle with is that there's something wrong with me and that I'm not enough. That is one of the primary core beliefs that they struggle with. And there's other two others, though, that also show up as well. The second is trust or safety. I'm, <laughs> I'm not safe to be able to share who I am, what I'm struggling with. I can't be open. I can't share my feelings with other people because the world isn't safe. Or the third one is powerlessness. There's nothing I can do. So it becomes this trifecta. There's something wrong with me. I'm not enough. I can't turn to anybody to actually get support because my world isn't safe. And there's nothing I can do about it. Oh, how heavy does that feel? How have, that's really, really heavy. So it makes sense that as we go along then and we find something that numbs all of that, oh, that feels so good because this is so freaking painful. So I think about the client whose dad died when he was five and, and these are actual clients and his core belief is, well, what's wrong with me? Am I not man enough? My dad never taught me any of the things and and the, the other dad that my mom married ended up being abusive to me. Is there something wrong with me? The client who was sexually abused and said, you have to keep this a secret. What kind of core beliefs does that person develop? There's something wrong with me. I can't trust the world. There's nothing I can do. The client who attempted suicide as a teenager and her parents kind of looked the other way. Um, they got her to the hospital, but they didn't really wrap her around with love. What does she end up believing about herself? So as you take a moment and just think, well, what wounds do I have? <clears throat> do I have a loss wound, a rejection wound, an abandonment wound? What, what do I end up believing about myself in that moment when I'm experiencing that pain? What lights up for you? And the interesting thing is that when you're not in pain, when you're not experiencing these kind of wounds being smacked, you don't necessarily believe that about yourself. I'm enough. Maybe I'm good at what I do. I'm pretty good at my job. You know, I can reach out to a friend, but the moment that that wound gets smacked, bam, those core beliefs just get triggered. And then two things happen almost, so, <clears throat> excuse me, Two things happen almost simultaneously from that point. From the moment that your wound gets smacked and the negative core belief lights up, you then are going to feel some emotions. You're going to either feel angry about it. You're going to feel sad about it. You're going to feel scared about it. But I don't know about you, but the world that I grew up in, especially as a male, was you're not allowed to feel. You're not allowed to experience feelings and and for me especially with my dad and his temper and his anger problems i absolutely believed that i couldn't be angry because i didn't want to turn out with like him so the interesting thing for me is when i started to date my wife um and i we we got engaged i told her oh i never i never get angry i'm i'm like zen i'm totally chill um but that actually wasn't true. There was so much anger underneath there and it would come out sideways in all kinds of crappy ways that would be painful to her. But I was in such denial and didn't believe that I could actually express my feeling that I just kind of kept it down. So those three emotions, and maybe it's all three at the same time, come up. But because I'm not allowed to feel them, shame then covers it all and shame shows up. Brene Brown's definition of shame is the deep and abiding experience and feeling that I'm flawed and defective and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. So we look at her definition and we think, oh, look, I already have a core belief that says there's something wrong with me, that I'm not enough. And I'm not safe enough to be able to share my emotions and share what's going on with me, because if I do, it's going to be horrible. <sighs> Shame just shows up. And Tammy mentioned a little bit about one of the things that I do with shame, and I didn't spend a lot of time in this presentation here about it because um, we don't have a ton of time, but there is there are several voices of shame that I've been able to develop and understand as I've done this work. But the one that I introduce people to the most or the most often is the judge. 
And the judge is that voice inside of your head that is constantly judging you, constantly telling you that you're flawed and defective and you're not trying hard enough and you're not perfect. And why are you doing that? And you shouldn't be doing that. And you should be doing more of this. And what's wrong with you that you're not doing it and you're, you're, you're seriously are inadequate in every level. So the judge has this bar up here that says, this is where you're supposed to be and this is where you are and you need to be up here. And the interesting thing with the judge is that the bar will be here and you'll work so hard to get up there, you'll get there and then the judge will say, well, well actually the bar is over here or actually the bar is over here. And it becomes like this moving target all the time. And the process of doing that you continue to be told over and over by this voice that you're not enough. You're not, you're not trying hard enough. There's something wrong with you. And, wh and why aren't you trying hard enough? And so it amplifies what I actually already believe in my deep core about myself. It just amplifies that. So I, I share that with you. Um, it's really helpful to actually write down what the judge says to you because one of the tools of moving forward is asking the judge, well, I mean, asking yourself, well, is that absolutely true? And if I had a, a, a person that I loved, a, a daughter or a son or um, my spouse or my best friend, would I say any of the things that the judge just told me to them? Would I ever say any of that to them? And the, the, the likelihood is no, you wouldn't. But man, the, the judge just beats us up and sabotages us and causes us to be disempowered. Why? Well, the judge actually thinks, uh, somebody used the analogy, it's like a government worker. Um, they, they do a lousy job, but they, they never get fired. Uh, so, and maybe that's judgmental. If there's a government worker out there, I'm really sorry. Uh, but the 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 judge is saying, you got to be perfect because I don't want you to be rejected anymore. You got to be perfect because I don't want you to be abandoned anymore. You got to be perfect because I don't want you to be betrayed anymore. So let me remind you just how imperfect you are so that when you get there, then you won't experience any of those attachment wounds anymore. So oftentimes when I introduce the judge to people, they're like, oh, I hate him. I hate her. I don't want her in my life. But when we actually identify, well, why are you there? Oh, it's because he's actually trying to help me. It just doesn't do a really good job. That actually makes it worse. But if you really are trying to help me avoid the pain. And so what I tend to do now is when I notice that my shadows are out, I will say to them, thank you. Thank you, judge, for trying to prevent me from being hurt again. I, I'm grateful for that. I'm not going to listen to you, though. I'm going to gonna do some other stuff that may be more helpful than listening to you. And we'll talk about what some of those are in just a minute. If, though, I can't get a handle on the shame, if I can't figure out how to develop some emotional tools to work through my emotions, and I can't learn how to become resilient to the shame, the only recourse is to numb because it is so incredibly painful. This, all of this stuff in this, these circles before are so, so incredibly painful. And what we know from the research is there's a strong correlation between childhood trauma and addiction later in life because early on, the addictive behaviors became an effective way of numbing the pain from the trauma. So there's a really strong correlation and there's thousands of ways of numbing. And the reason why you're here in the meetings is because you either have found one of those ways to numb and it's ruined your life or you are the partner of someone who's using one of those ways to numb and you've ended up using some other ways to numb your pain. And that's why you're here is because you're like, I don't want, I don't want to do that. I'm not actually living my life. And I get that because I did that too. As I'm sitting there and I'm 24 years old and my professor's like, you know, if you really want to be a good social worker, you you need to be able to do your stuff. What what numbing tool did I use? Well, I was using porn at that point, but I was also in huge denial of that, you know, just and so much shame, like so much shame about the porn and thinking, oh, my gosh, if anybody found out, it would be awful. So I didn't manage the shame 
And instead, I just found all these different ways of numbing and I got trapped in a cycle. And some of you may be familiar with this cycle. This is the addiction cycle. It always starts out with pain. And then as we go around, it's gonna, we're gonna add shame on top of that. So it always starts out with pain. So the, the pain of addiction, uh, the pain of abandonment, the pain of rejection, the pain of neglect, the pain of betrayal. And I begin to move around and I begin in my mind to think, well, what can I do to, where can I go? How can, what website can I check out? What can I do to, to try and to numb that? I haven't done anything. I'm just thinking about it. The person who's struggling with alcohol is like, I don't have any alcohol. When, when can I get to the store? What am I going to get? What, what brand, uh, what flavor, what am I going to get? And they're just thinking about that. And then we move into ritual. I log on to my favorite sites. The, the person with addiction was struggling with alcohol drives to their favorite store. They're driving. That's the ritual. They're going and doing some of the things that's setting them up. And then we end up acting out. And afterwards, oh, the shame. The judge just smacks me upside the head. I can't believe you that you did that. What's wrong with you? You're horrible. You're despicable. Now the pain has just doubled. Now I'm feeling pain and shame. And if I, again, don't know how to manage that, then around and around and around I go. The piece that we focus on a lot, especially, and I understand why we do that, but the, what we focus on a lot, especially, at least for me, and I know I'm not alone in this, is like I focus so much on the acting out. Ah, oh, I failed again. I just had three months of recovery and I threw it out the window because I just lost my, and I, we focus on that behavior of, oh, and there's so much shame about the acting out piece. And I love that in the meetings, we, we count our days and we talk about how much sobriety that we have. And, and I think that there's so much value in that. And the challenge with that is that we also are focusing on that acting out. What, really the healing happens is when we start to focus on the pain and the shame. What kept driving me to act out all the time? And what am I doing now that I've gone from day one to day two to 30 days to, to you know, two months? What's, what am I doing that's helping me be so success, successful in that? Well, the first thing that's happened is you've gone to a meeting and you've shared your stuff and a bunch of people gave you their phone numbers and told you how much they love you and they're so proud of you. Well, we just helped deal with some of that shame. We just brought it down a little bit and there's some power with that. And as we continue to go in this recovery principle, we, we need to continue to focus on the pain and begin to do some wound care around the, that pain, around the rejection and the abandonment and, and the betrayal and whatever, and start to do some wound care around that. And as we begin to, to do wound care around that, and it's less painful, the craving, the need to go back around is less. I'm not saying that it ever goes away, but it's less. And as we do that, we begin to rewire our brain from what it's learned about, here's my pain and here's how I numb it, to here's my pain and here's like five other things that I can do to deal with my pain besides go to my drug of choice. And we begin to retrain our brain that there's other venues to deal with the pain other than just continuing to go around our cycle. The piece to really want you to understand is that our acting out is an attempt to try and get our needs met. So if I have a, well, I do, I have a rejection wound, I have an abandonment wound, uh, I have uh, an abuse wound. Well, what did porn do for me? Well, porn never rejected me. Porn never abandoned me. It was always there for me. I, I could turn to it and it would be there every time. I could count on it. It was reliable. Felt like sh crap afterwards, but, uh, but man, it was there. And so as I started to realize, well, that was me trying to feel acceptance. That was me trying to be comforted. As I started to recognize that, I could start to open up and figure out, well, are there other ways to manage this pain where in the end I don't feel worse about myself? Are there other things that I could do instead? Because if I don't figure that out, I'm, what's going to happen is I'm going to start feeling mutated emotions. 
anger turns into resentment and jealousy and apathy. S sadness turns into depression and complacency and fear turns into anxiety and and the sense of hopelessness. These are the darker feelings that usually we're so tired of feeling that pain is so intense that that's usually when we say, okay, I'm going to a meeting or I'm going to call up a therapist and see if they can help. And I love, I mean, it's sad that we have to get to this point, but that's usually what is the catalyst for us to be able to start healing. And at least for me, as I continue to live in a very depressed place where I was suicidal sometimes and I was so depressed I, and angry, oh, so angry. I realized I got to do something. I got to do something in order to do that. And what I did and what I've written in my book is how you do that. And we go back to the core, which is that pain and that peace. And we begin to treat the, the wounds themselves. If you can identify what your wounds are, loss, neglect, rejection, abandonment, betrayal, and abuse, it actually also helps you identify what your need might be because it's the exact opposite of that. So if you have experienced loss, what you probably need is some assurance that everything's gonna be okay. If you've experienced neglect, what you probably need is someone to pay attention to you, to help you be present with you in that moment. If you've experienced rejection, you probably need somebody to accept you in that moment. If you've been abandoned, you need someone to be in your life and say, hey, I'm not going anywhere. If you've been betrayed, you need someone that you can trust. And if you've been abused, you need compassion. So when you can identify the wound, it really helps to also then identify what <coughs> the need is and then get it. And once we begin to identify that, we can then find ways to connect with other people in 12-step groups in, I know it's hard to do in COVID right now, but in, in reaching out to friends and family and beginning to share a little bit more of our story and letting people love on us because that's where the healing happens. The heal, our healing happens through healthy connection that reminds us that we are enough. And in the process, it shifts our core belief. It rewrites it. And I remember that I am enough. So I'll, I'll end with this and then we can open up for questions. Um, just yesterday, I was having a, a client who's, who got kicked out of his house because his wife had found out that he was cheating on her. And he's living in an apartment and he's, he's struggling with, and he's done a lot of recovery work, which I'm so proud of him for. And he is still so angry. And we were able to drill down, well, he's angry because he has these rejection wounds. That's a huge, that's a huge wound, right? Rejection wound. And his, he, he ended up having a medical issue that required him to go to the hospital. It wasn't COVID related, but he, he went there and he's in the hospital room all by himself. What wound is that? Abandonment, neglect, whatever. And his wife calls and doesn't seem to be concerned about that at all. She's concerned because there's a family function that's supposed to happen that's really important to her and they're all worried about the COVID issue. And so she's really worried about, so she's not showing up for him. Wow, that just smacked his wounds. What, what emotions came out for him? Anger, frustration, like that. As we sat with him, as I sat with him yesterday and helped him be able to get to a place where he could connect with what those wounds are and what the truth was, we were able to duct tape the judge's mouth shut for a minute and he's able to actually tap into, you know, I'm enough. I'm a loving husband. I'm a loving person. I do care. The moment he tapped into that, I said, okay, if that, if you were in that state when your wife called, how would you have responded? And he did this most amazing, beautiful job of being empathic and showing up. I didn't have to give him any of the words. I didn't have to coach him what to say. He just like, whoa. And he showed up. <clears throat> and he's like, wow, what just happened? I'm like, you just cut through all of all of the circles and you got right down to the core of it. You're in a place of peace. You know you matter. You know that you have talents and skills and abilities. You have value. And you were able to stay hold of that and identify that your wife is also wounded. And how beautiful was that? 
that you then were able to attend to her wounds and and have wound care for her and he's like whoa so that's the power of of this work is when we really connect and we'll break through all of that we are able to tap into our own wound care and then we can also do wound care for those around us that we love as well so thank you <coughs> great information we have a question so for those of you um that have joined we aren't going to do the uh, people requesting to share, but if you IM me questions, I'm going to ask them of Troy. So the first one, Troy, is I feel like my grief will never end. Childhood grief and current grief. Does it end? I feel like other people sense my grief and reject me for it. Mm. That I love that question, and thank you. I believe that grief can end. Um, I believe at least I can speak for me that it has, but there's work that has to happen. And the grieving, there's no timeline on it. I got to say, like some people think you should be over it by like yesterday. And so there's no timeline on the grieving, but there are tools and, and, and exercise and then structured things that you can do to facilitate the grieving. And I also hear what you're saying when you say that some people are rejecting me because I'm in pain. And what does that do? Well, it just it just rips that wound open even more. So part of it is being able to find people who can hold space and share that pain with you. That's a really important part of that. Hopefully you've been able to find some people like that in the rooms where they can hold space. And the other part is to, to find ways to do the wound care for yourself and recognize, well, I'm grieving, but what's the need that is not being met? What's that need that's not being met? And how can I find some healthy ways to, to get some of those needs met so that maybe the pain isn't as acute? And as that wound maybe starts to heal a little bit, I'm able to be a little bit more present. I'm able to rewrite some of those negative core beliefs a little bit more powerfully in my life. And I'm, I'm much more able to manage the emotions and get my needs met in ways that uh, are relieving. So I would invite you, um, the, the slide set is the sexual addiction one, but on it, Troy's book, Finding Peace, a workbook on healing from loss, neglect, rejections, abandonment, betrayal, and abuse. And I think the process of working through things in a workbook fashion, you know, is really helpful. I was thinking, uh, so if you have questions, please IM them to me and I'll be happy to ask them of him. Um, and we have one, but um, I was thinking while you're talking about, you know, the person in the hospital and the wife and all of that, and to be able to own what my need is and to be able to, to even articulate it. So, you know, if I, Troy, I'm, you know, what you're saying right now is bumping up against this wound, you know, and even stepping back, I need a moment or whatever, or for for you to be able to go, oh, I hear you. Let me, you know, I mean, just having the the um, knowledge, you know, having that um, enlightenment that there is a wound, so it isn't just the reaction. So, yeah. Okay. So the next question is, um, uh, uh, my mother is losing her child. I saw my son when he was seven, and now he's fourteen due to my addiction at the time seven years ago. My father took him away from me and flew my son. Um, to the in-laws out of state. I have not had any contact with my son for seven years due to the father not letting me speak to him. How do I feel better about myself? I'm always going through a death. It's, I think it. I think what she's saying is I feel like I'm always going through a death in the family. I'm so used to being numb, having numbed it, you know, in addiction. And I've tried to reach out to him and the father won't let me you know, I'm gonna have to take it to court. But so with those circumstances, you know, any thoughts on how you you look at those wounds? Yeah, so first I'm sad with you. I'm sad that that's happened. That's, that's a, it's a complicated loss because they didn't actually die. They're still there, they're still alive, but you're not able to have any access to them. So that there's a betrayal wound wrapped in there. There's a loss wound that's wrapped up in there. And both of those are really, really painful. And so I'm sad with you. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that you asked the question. The key piece that I want you to consider is what do you end up believing about yourself? What are those three core beliefs that are showing up? What do you end up believing about yourself? 
the powerlessness wound like that i mean the powerlessness message i would imagine that's pretty profound for you like, like there's nothing i can do but then you also just said well i probably have to take him to court so you identified well there maybe is something i can do so what we first do is we take a look at those core beliefs is there something wrong with me and let me challenge that let me work through and see if there's any truth to that am i powerless let me see if there's any truth to that are there people that i can trust are there people that i can turn to for support who can understand this grief and when we start to challenge those core beliefs a little bit it shakes it up a little bit and then we give ourselves permission to then say well i'm not powerless i'm enough i've done my best i'm, I'm worthy of love and belonging there are people i can trust now how can i work through this situation and get some um some hope and some repair for all of that what can i do who can i reach out to that can support me and and working through that and it sounds like there's a part of you that says that that's going to do but i that's what i would work with first is what do you end up what's going on on the inside we don't have the ability to control anything really that anybody else has done on the outside but what's going on on the inside and how is that driving my numbing behavior and let me challenge it to see if it's actually true or not true well, and I was thinking the grief uh, that, you know, that if I'm reading all of this right, that addiction has has taken my time with my child away from me. I mean, that's a real grief, um, you know, to process through as well. Yeah. Next question. Um, I want to say thank you so much for speaking, and I'm glad I found out about this. I've been struggling really hard lately. I have six years of sobriety, yay, and have PTSD. I have been working uh, diligently every day to make sure I'm doing all the right positive things to keep moving forward. But now I am hitting a new struggle of why I am a uh, uh, struggle of why I am hearing this judge, why I'm getting angry. Why am I still being triggered when my trauma has been over for so long? Oh, that's a good one. Um, what is wrong with me? Why do I need to keep chasing addictions, et cetera? Your talk has made me view myself in a different light, and I really appreciate it. I now understand myself a little bit better. Thank you. I hope you buy that. Fi Finding Peace by Troy Love on Amazon. It's not just a plug. It's a resource. So, um, but, but so true that it's like, oh, my gosh, that's so far in the past. Like you talked about the abandonment when you were moments old and how that's influenced your life. Well, why why don't you just get over it, you know? Well, because when these kind of wounds happen, they get lodged in our body at a cellular level. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, does a really wonderful job of helping you. So when you've experienced PTSD, which probably has several of those wounds going on, right? You think, well, man, it's been six years. Why in the hell am I not over it already? Well, because the message, that wound got lodged in at your cellular level. And then every time it gets hit, those core beliefs get lodged, uh, woken up. So when we, when we actually go down and we, it's not the event that's the trauma. It's what we've ended up believing about ourselves that really is what's happening. And so when we can unlock that part and we can challenge the core beliefs and that I don't know what kind of work you've done. EMDR does an amazing job of helping us rewrite those negative core beliefs, but really challenging and saying, you know, there isn't anything wrong with me. Some really crappy stuff happened in my life and I'm enough and I matter and I'm worthy of love, even though those things happen and shifting that because again, when we look at the trauma, almost simultaneously there's a negative core belief associated with it and once we've rewritten that if that trigger happens again we're like oh yeah that was a thing that kind of sucked uh what are we having for dinner and it's not denial it's i'm i'm healed from that part yeah and i've had the opportunity to do emdr which i needed um but it was one of those things where like you're saying it doesn't like erase the memories but it just takes the emotional, the gut wrench, you know, away for which I'm really grateful, you know, and, and I'll, I'll tell, I have a fantastic therapist, but she was really helpful. Like there was stuff and I just couldn't figure it out, but it was su such old stuff. It was, you know, old child. And, and one of the things that she helped me with was understanding that I could reach back and parent to that child where, where that wound was. And I've, 
you know, I've been able to replay that because it's come up again. Gosh, how strange, you know, but I've been able to reuse that tool and understand what was happening and again, not get sucked down the, you know, the vortex. So hmm. got another question. How do I find peace when some of the deepest wounds I've experienced have been in recovery groups? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Hmm. When I've reached out hoping that people in recovery would be safe, the abuse and betrayal revictimize me. Who do I trust? That thank you, and I'm I'm so sad that that's happened to you. One of the the challenges uh, when we look at the, who who shows up to a twelve step group, it's not all the it's not all the healed people. <laughs> not all the people have worked through all their emotions and they're like, Ooh, we're good. It's, it's the people who are walking along this journey and they're struggling too. And they're just as wounded. And so uh, even the other day, uh, I, I reached out to two of my best friends because I was struggling with some stuff and they immediately started to go into the platitudes and the lecture. And I was, I was, it, number one, it was 1130 at night. So that was probably not helping. I was pissed. I'm like, I'm out, I'm out. And they're like, wait, wait, don't go away. Wait, what, what? And I'm like, I'm not talking to you, all right? I'm just out. And then the next day I was able to talk to them and like, look, what I needed was this. And they said, well, you didn't say that. And I'm like, well, okay. Number one, I was trying to do this through text, which probably was not the most effective, but you're right. I didn't say what I needed. So they were confused. They were trying to be helpful, but I wasn't clear about what I needed. And so rewinding that, I would have said, hey, somebody said this to me, it really triggered me. What I really need is to hear that I'm gonna be okay, that it's going to be all right, that you still love me. That's what I really need. And clarifying that made it easier for them to be able to know how to show up for me. And they did, but because I wasn't clear, they showed up for the way that they thought would be helpful and it wasn't. So, I, you know, I don't know why those people did that to you in the, in the 12 step. And I hear like the despair and the, like, who can I trust? And I don't have magical answer for you. What I'm hoping that you'll do is maybe find one or two people to start with and then add a third and then add a fourth people that you can try to test it out and, and also share with them. Here's what I actually need. Let me teach you what I need and see if you can show up for me. And I'm going to try to do the same for you and do wound care that way. And it is hard because it is a bunch of broken people. So yeah, I, I had to learn because I was sharing too much. And what I had to learn is I had to share in little increments and test it. And that was, I learned mostly. I still get, you know. Okay, so the next one, Troy, thank you so much for your presentation. I checked all the boxes for all those wounds you said, but I guess my main ones would be neglect and rejection. I was addicted to alcohol and weed for a couple of years, and I'm clean for a year and two months. Yay. Rationally speaking, my life is two, 20 times better than I was a year ago. I have a, you know, I have good car, home stuff. Emotionally, I feel unstable, confused, exhausted sometimes. Is this normal? I work very hard recovery on my recovery and I've been very compulsive about work lately, very focused on making money so I can get my needs met and never depend on another coin or emotional support from my family of origin. I don't feel safe close to them. My latest sponsor presented the 12 steps away and I'm lost on which program to follow. It seems like I need most of them. I'm <laughs> I get that. Uh, I'm currently in therapy and pretty much stable on my medication. Can you give me some guidance? Thank you. Um, I'm glad that you're finding it helpful. And I love that you're asking these questions because when you, when you start to ask these questions, your brain begins to look for the answers. So you're asking some really, really good questions. And what you're, you're looking for is a little bit of direction. And you said that the emotional piece is still uh, a big part. You've been able to to manage the recovery part, and that's amazing, and I'm proud of you for that. And what you're saying is, now maybe I need to start learning how to develop some emotional resiliency, because you also said, I've noticed that I'm doing some compulsive stuff, I'm uh, work-related, I'm, I'm trying to earn a ton of money. All of that is a different way of numbing. That's that yellow circle. It's a different way of numbing. It's not the it's not the drug, but it is a different way of numbing. And when we do that, that's just a sign. It's not to shame ourselves. It's not to let our judge just smack us and say, well, you suck. 
um, it's really saying, oh, there's some still, there's some pain still there. So let me drill down. Let me unwrap the bandage a little bit and see if I can figure out, well, what is that? And you identified the emotion is fear. So what's underneath the fear? What's the wound that's activating that fear? And then once you identify it and put a name to it, you then have just doing that gives you an opportunity to then say, okay, what tools do I already have in my toolbox that can address that? And if I'm looking at all these tools and thinking, oh, none of them are really the greatest tool, you can ask your therapist, you can ask other people in the 12 step, say, what do you guys do with this? But you've actually been able to name it and give it a name so that you know more about it. Because it seems like it's a little nebulous for you right now, and maybe this presentation helping you drill down a little bit, but asking some of these deeper questions may give you direction. So hopefully this has been helpful. We're out of time. I don't want to, uh, to cross into the next section. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Troy. So his book, Finding Peace, workbook by Troy Love is on Amazon. I, I do know that. Um, and that may be a really helpful um, way of starting to look at this in a, in a deeper way, in a healing way. So, so join us. Uh, Carol Clark will be on in an hour from now. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing as many of you as possible back then. Thanks, Troy. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you want more information, you can also go to TroyLLove.com. There you go. Lots of resources. Bye, everybody.